I would be interested to hear, what's the story of, of you two? Uh, well, uh, this is the President of the United States. Hello, I'm Chris Lisserman and welcome to Sparks, a series by Interactive Workshops. From how to spark performance to how to spark culture, we're sparking things in work and life. Another thing you can spark, Jonna, is a jet boost. Oh yeah. Not a jet lag, but when you travel the right way. Why do we call it jet lag? Surely it just means we feel most wakeful at other times. Yeah, surely going the right way. We get, we get jet, jet boost, boost, definitely. Wake up early, go to bed on time. Exactly. Instant fix. Stay up late, don't feel tired. But someone who might not be experiencing a jet boost, may be experiencing a bit of jet lag. Welcome from the United States, IWNY's Cody Rowland. Welcome to the show. Cody in the house. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm excited to be here. Cody, how are you? Uh, good. Feeling a little bit of jet boost. It is 3 a.m. <laughs> in my world, but uh, I'm actually wide awake and feeling really good. Cody, you look a million dollars as always. And love the caps. Thanks for those. Yeah. I, you know, this is uh, a gift from the States. I really uh, wanted to bring a little bit of home to uh, my second home, especially what we're going to talk about today. Right. We don't know what baseball is, but apparently there's baseball caps. But um, we've been wearing, I've realized now I've been this. wearing mine wrong. Have you? Yeah, because look. Oh, yeah. Co Cody's got a different look going on. Real American, proper way round. Do you not find you get like a bit of suntan just in that middle bit there? <laughs> yeah, you, yes. Oh, you absolutely get sunburned yeah. right there. Yeah, okay. yeah. You get right. I'm going to take mine off just so I don't get any sunburn from the, the studio lights. Um, but you welcome to leave yours on, John. I can handle it, actually. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're the figure of fun. Um, welcome to the show, Cody. Jono, welcome back. Thank We've you. got a very special topic that we're going to be talking about today. I can't. It's one of those topics I can't believe we're introducing to a business podcast. It may be too much. It may be too much. We're going to talk about how to spark family. Chris, did you not do biology lessons at school? <laughs> we're not going to go down that route. We're, we're talking about that today. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not allowed to make talk a family. How to spark a family. Yeah, we're not oh, going to talk right. about the birds and bees. How to spark it. So you've got that family. How do you spark it? What does it take to make a great family? How do you lead your family? Is there anything we can learn from family life and take into the business world? And I also see it as the other way around. You know, I see my work colleagues or some of the relationships I have there in a familial way. So for me, the I, the concept of family is not just about what's the one that might live at home if you have one at home or the one that you might build if you ha want to build one, mm. but also the familial tribal nature of work life. And there is some important relationship dynamics, I think, some, some power dynamics that happen that are familial in nature that we see on David Attenborough, the silverback, mm. you know, could be happening at work. Very true, very true. But before we dive in too far into the family topic, I would be interested to hear, what's the story of, of you two? Uh, well, uh, this is the President of the United States Office of Interactive Workshops, am I? <laughs> yeah, not quite in the, uh, in the White House yet. A strategic pause yeah. in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Cody and I have worked together for possibly nearly 15 years, I think. Yeah, just about. And um, he's very talented. He's uh, eternally energetic and uh, hardworking and fun to be around. And Cody um, runs our New York office and it's great to be alongside you, brother. We had a very nice hike through the New Jersey forest and a bathe in a river a month or so ago as we planned and strategized our future together. No, no better place to do some uh, forward thinking, some strategy than along a beautiful babbling brook. Babbling brook. Couldn't have said perfect. that to myself. It's yeah. perfect. And, and what was your first impression of John? That go, that's a long way back. But do you remember? I do. I very distinctly do. We were in Zurich for a train the trainer. And I believe we before we even started the train the trainer, it was a pre-training dinner. So my first impression of John was at a little re uh, attic in a restaurant in <laughs> Zurich. You met John in the attic. I met John in an attic. Love Zurich. Right. In Zurich. And... <laughs> We, there was 20 of us from that organization there and Jonna and one of his partners. And I spent the entire evening next to Jonna because I just was... Sorry about that. No, I was enthralled by him. Oh, great. So I should have been there networking with my peers and I wanted to spend more time with him than with my peers. I think I'm... It's high I'm, prize. You know, you know, I'm really bad, Chris. <laughs> but 
I think it's very likely that at that point, Cody was a very important stakeholder for the project we're working on. So I just sat next to him and spent the whole evening mm. like trying to build rapport and persuade him yeah. that it was good. Yeah, it was all That's fine. That must be what Delight. happened. Yeah. That's my uh, powers of deception. Because I was like the <laughs> lowest person on the totem pole in that, in that room. And yeah, because yeah, in international work, America's always a small country, right? It's yeah, never that yeah. important. No, no one cares no. about the... No one's talking about it. No one... I, was, I was legitimately junior, <laughs> both in years and experience, by at least <laughs> 10 of everybody else in there. But uh, <laughs> I monopolized his, his time because I was just so, uh, so enthralled by... Oh, thanks. Donna. Well, I, I can be intriguing, and I am a professional at having entertaining dinners, but my... Actually, speaking of uh, familial relationships, mm. my voice coach, Ruth Epstein, she is a matriarch. And she told me, she said, John, like, when you're out at dinners, you're, like, you're trying to make the fun for everybody. And it, they're kind of exploiting you in a way. If you just have a dinner where you just sit quietly and don't say anything and see what happens to the mood. So I then, at the business dinners, I'd then sit on the end and not say anything. And I'd be sat there, tumbleweed, sometimes. So, yeah, I, did, I enjoy making a good dinner. I enjoy... Um, putting it out there, but my mm. mum, Ruth, she said, son, you got to just, you can't be on all the time. you got to, if you're working in the day, you've got to calm down in the evening. I feel like that's an interesting route into family life. What were family dinners like growing up for you two? And oh, maybe firstly, tell us a little bit about your family. How, how many kids? Uh, current or growing up? Current kids. Current. Well, I have four. Okay. And family dinners at our place are... Uh, Sometimes hurried, sometimes very loud, um, always focused on family. My wife does a great job of making that a key moment in all of our days. Mm -hmm. and, but again, with four kids, four different activities going every night, uh, schoolwork, all, everything that's going on, admittedly some nights they are dinners on the go or uh, very short dinners around the, the dinner table. But my wife is very good about being intentional. This is family time. This is a, mm. a moment in the day that we all come together and try to reconnect. And then growing up, was that different brothers and sisters? So growing up, I had, I have one brother, one younger brother, one younger sister, and it was similar. Mm. It, it was similar. Um, my mom and dad did a very good job of making that a, a key moment in, in our days. And so I think that tradition and my wife's family was, was similar. So they, that tradition we've tried to continue in our family today. Mm. John, what about you? My overwhelming memory of my family dinners growing up, I have a, an older sister, younger brother. The main uh, thing that I remember is my, my dad and my sister arguing over the meaning of words. And it was a, like a little um, psychodrama that would play out at least maybe once a week through my teenage years. My sister's very intelligent. She's, got, she's a doctor. She's, got, she's really smart. So she would uh, be reading something and come to the table and use a word. My dad, also very smart, would say, oh, that's, that's not exactly what that word means, darling. And then they would have a really large argument about what it means, which inevitably ended up with my dad leaping up, going to his office that was in the garden, getting a dictionary and come back and someone was right and wrong. Then someone would be upset. So there was that. And obviously my mum's incredible cooking, some good conversation. And then I just used to be the, try to be the joker, which also annoys everybody because someone's just constantly joking, it kind of puts the limit on the deeper meaningfuls you can have. Mm. I can only think of my poor brother who wanted, wanted none of it. Wow. Just probably just wanted to have his dinner. Yeah. I mean, that was a lot of like my dinners growing up was, was, was just people wanting to have their dinner. It was actually was quite, it? quite a quiet experience. Yeah. And that wasn't a bad thing. It wasn't awkward. It wasn't a tumbleweed moment. That was just the norm. And I thought that was how everyone had their dinners. There'd be a little bit of conversation. But if it was quiet, things were good. Whereas when I met, when, met my wife oh. and had family dinner with my wife's family before, uh, before we were married, whole different experience yeah. where if it was quiet, Someone was, something was really wrong. annoyed. Yeah. Something was wrong. Something had gone down. Do you know when, when I got married, that's what I, I had the other way around. It's like our dinners were like a riot of conversation. Exactly. The food's finished. We're exactly. still there. People an hour competing later. with each other, yeah. shouting on top yeah, yeah, of each yeah. other, trying to beat each other with stories. Uh, then we get. I get to my my wife's house. Everything's very calm, ordered. Food straightforward, yeah. delicious. Yeah. We just sit. Yeah. yeah. Civilized. Like, yeah. When does the awkward? <laughs> when, who gets the dictionary? When does the dictionary come out? <laughs> when does the dictionary come out? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, how we have these experiences and we have some experiences from our, our past and, and for you guys having families now, you've got different experiences that you're part of leading. Yeah, now. but we should say also, I think this is, a, this is really important to think about the word with a small f. Mm. Our family isn't just the one we're born mm. into or the one that we maybe mm. have, but for some of us, we may never have our own children. Some of us, we may never have a partner, but we then choose a family family you choose 
the tribe you want to belong to, the people you surround yourself with. It might be in a sports club or work or it could be in a, a, a church or religious environment or it could be that there's a pub table that every Sunday you're there drinking with those people or um, whatever. Uh, or in the, in the US, you know, there's all kinds of uh, fraternities and things that you right. may or may not join. In fact, one of the, some of the facets of our recruitment over there is every everyone who every time we run a recruitment in the US, someone's from a fraternity. Like, what, what exactly? I've seen movies, but what exactly is this all about? Like, it's actually a, a sisterhood or a brotherhood, and they're trying to build that connection. That's how it's going down over there, isn't it, Cody? Yeah, absolutely. And and talking about family, especially on a podcast like this, it is this is a sensitive topic because everybody's family looks different and feels different, but. There's absolutely some things that we can learn. There's things that I've learned from my family that I bring to work every day. And there are absolutely things I bring from work back to my family every day. I mean, it's a very symbiotic re relationship. So I completely agree. Whether your family is that nuclear family or a family that is a community that you've built around you, it's it's all about people in your life that mean something to you, that you're committed to, that you that you love and that love you and support you. And how do you nurture and develop those relationships. Yeah. Mm. So as we I talk wonder, about it on the so as we talk about it on the podcast, we we're gonna use it as a big F small F in big various F, ways. Small F. We might get a few things wrong, forgive us listeners, of uh, of any of that. You mentioned Cody, you'd learn things from work and taking them back to family and vice versa. Are there a few things or maybe something top of mind, maybe something recently that you thought, actually that applies to my kids or something from your kids. Actually that applies to this coaching conversation. You know Interestingly enough, on the plane yesterday, I was reading about how to have difficult conversations, conversations that are fraught with emotion, that you are invested in, that have a lot of risk. And I immediately thought of different conversations that happen in the, in the home. So the, the whole book was written about how to do that in a work context. And when uh, you're in the boardroom or you're in a meeting room or you're with your team member and, and things are, are really fraught with emotion, there's no difference than a, a meeting room or the the family room or the den at home. There's the, so those same principles apply how to navigate difficult, emotionally charged conversations at work or at home or with your friends or with those that, that you love the most. It's there are universal principles that apply in any situation. Mm, it's true. It, should we be leading our families in the in the same way? It's an interesting thought, isn't it? There are I, things we can I, take, but I, should we lead them in the same way? I reckon there's, I, I do think there's cultural differences because I think uh, if you think about the typical uh, British slash English approach to family, it's much more apologetic. Sorry about my family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, forgive them. <laughs> uh, both of my children, I have a 12 year old and a 14 year old, both of, by the time of age th uh, 12 already suggested that going to leave home as soon as possible. Um, they live in a seemingly a paradise where their every need is met and their, you know, their parents are on the stand. I just dropped my son at sports day this morning. Other kids are in the, on the bus. I'm there in the car making sure they're, they live in a seemingly a paradise, but they, they kind of, they're quite keen to move on from our family <laughs> yeah. at some point. I think the, the British uh, way of that is, Generally, like, yeah, that's, of course. But I think I feel like uh, American family's got a bit more, like there's a more of a substance to the brand and it means a bit more over there. Uh, Is that fair, may Cody? Maybe I'm just watching too much of Yellowstone, the Dutton Ranch, <laughs> and Kevin Costner. I do everything for this family. You know, the, the kids saying, I don't, I don't even really know why. We'll you never see you. <laughs> you don't even like me. I'm doing it for you, you know. <laughs> I'm going to ensure you're uh, Paul John Dutton the sixth, you know, like. <laughs> Yeah, with the with the letters after the what numbers after the name. Like we we we, I guess in some we got the kind of lords and ladies and yeah. things, and there's a bit right. of that. But in is the, it, is the, that, the masses, is that not a description of your home life, Cody. Cody Dutton Are you the screaming third? at them. I do everything for this family. <laughs> you are so unappreciative. Yeah. Yeah. Shoveling a dead body in the garden just just to try and keep the family on a kind of level playing field. That's something that that, that series is about. There are, there's definitely similarities. Uh, no I, dead bodies. But no let's, dead let's bodies. Clear. Uh, maybe some skeletons, but uh, <laughs> no, we, I do intentionally have conversations with my kids about what it means to be a Roland and what it means to be part of our family and different values that we hold uh, dear. And as a part of this family, certain expectations of them in terms of their behavior and conduct and how they present themselves to the world. I try to not do it in such a way that it's a, a, a guilt laden uh, a, approach, but absolutely there is a, as part of this family, there are 
certain expectations of you and you're expected to uphold the family name. That's wow. really cool. So it, I That's did really mention cool. that there were, I feel there are differences. I'm not sure it's not the same everywhere in the US or the no, same everywhere no, here. No. But I feel like the general sense of family, even like when I'm in social situations where I've been in the US, people, you've got your block parties, the families get together, they're doing stuff. You know, there's a sort of different type of social cohesion to what I see in suburbia in, in mm. London. It's very common for families to, groups of families to go on vacations together. Yeah. And just mm. the, 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 Husbands and the wives and the kids, everybody are friends, and they just decide that that's how they want to spend their time is with these different family groups. So you you mentioned yeah. tribes or or communities. Mm. I mean, they've they've built their own mini tribe and mini community, and it's not necessarily family in terms of the big F. The the you know we're all blood related, but it's they have become family to each other. And for me, we've lived away from home, grew up in Utah. Both my wife and I grew up in Utah. We have not lived in Utah for twenty years now. And so the concept of family has had to shift for us because family is not, I mean, yes, we still have our parents around. They, they love us. We love them, but they're not in our lives daily and we're not in their lives daily. So when we have needs, when somebody is sick, when something happens, we don't necessarily turn to our family. We have to turn to our community that we've built, whether mm -hmm. that's in Hong Kong or whether it's been in New Jersey, we've, we've had to build a small F families wherever mm -hmm. we live. Yeah. It's interesting that you have that culture within your family, like the Roland culture i think it's true that we probably don't have that attachment Surely they're not the, did you not have the listen and did that someone not have the chat with you about defending the listen brand well being a listen it, it lends itself to a, a bit of branding like with Alyssa family and you yeah. know Alyssa baby and You've got i'm the Alyssa man it's a <laughs> Alyssa woman yeah but um this, it's not really a thing, isn't it? We've, in, in the States, you've got, whether it's the Simpsons or the Kardashians, there's a kind of a brand to the surname, whereas here... Joey Essex? The Essexes? <laughs> No. We don't really have it, do we? Even no. David Beckham really talk about the whole family collective as the Beckhams is not really a thing. You should, you must watch Yellowstone. It's it's frighteningly brilliant, but uh, it, it you do see the difference between mm. our, our idea of perhaps our mental ideal of families is quite dysfunctional, whereas somehow in the US it seems more uh, real, mm. like a real, like an actual what the name actually means, and and kind of localized to so that one mm. family. You're saying this in our family we do. Yeah. these things rather than you should as yeah. a kid or can as a family behavior can we can we tip that into the, the dialogues about work yeah because i think I, we can i feel when i started out i tried to make a company that felt like a family and i think it's part of our strategy to have a family feel mm. and people who join say i like the family feel and it feels like a family people say that it's true but as we've grown it's much harder to maintain probably like a real family cousins second cousins once removed it's a real challenge. Like the, the benefits of those close relationships is really high when they're good. But uh, also, as you grow, I think it's really hard to maintain. And I'm interested whether you guys try and use family-type dynamics or you see that, whether here or at work, in clients. Like, the, again, the, the dominant silverback, male or female. But there's often a power dynamic, isn't there, with a, a key old senior figure that is ro ruling the roost but uh, equally, sometimes you see childlike behavior from team members. Do you think humans, do you think we just, we set up those systems or do you think that that's where there's no process or there's a lack of structure that those dynamics are amplified? What do you think, Cody? It's a really good question. I think that groups, it, within groups, leaders naturally come to the forefront. And for many of us, our family was our first exposure, first experience with a group environment. And so I think it's natural for us to develop paternal or maternal tendencies within, within groups. I know that my leadership style is very uh, paternalistic and something that I have to sometimes watch and, and be careful about because I can be too, I will be careful. I'm not the dad. I'm not a father in this. I mean, I'm a yeah, big F father in the, in, in the work. So <laughs> I <laughs> just thinking about uh, some of Cody's the diary of Cody's new new hire is put in is in a father like way put in an enormous amount of things in place. Not saying what do you think you would like to do today, but this is, is all your the things, itinerary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is your <laughs> itinerary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She is very well set up for the week. She's going top down. Yeah, big dad. <laughs> big daddy's in the house. <laughs> yes. There's, oh no. 
This is like uh, a like a vacation itinerary, which <laughs> <laughs> interestingly enough looks very much like a roll in vacation itinerary. Does it? Oh, every no. every yeah. minute I'm of every day. I'm going to predict that the, uh, that Jonna doesn't have a vacation itinerary. <laughs> we actually the minute. we went on holiday with two families when we had young kids, and uh, we we were the middle family, and one family was incredibly unstructured, and the other family was in in, in itinerary land. I've made a mental note not to go on holiday with Cody, but uh, itinerary land family. Every day, what they wanted to do, but not very um, structured family didn't even wake up until after the start of the itinerary. So every day, itinerary family was upset <laughs> before the other family had even woken up. <laughs> and Steph and I were like, yeah. there, like, oh my gosh, we're in the middle of this. Like, uh, what do we do? We can we can do a bit of itinerary. We can do a bit of freelance. But uh, yeah, so you're on itinerary family. We're gonna maximize every moment of that oh vacation. Gosh. I come home and I do need a vacation from my vacation because it's but. <laughs> I'm only in wherever we are, whatever that cool destination is for a limited amount of time. I'm going to get as much out of it as I can. And then presumably you have an itinerary for your rest after your vacation. Well, that's that's where it falls apart. because I don't. <laughs> Intense section I, of lying I, down. I, Intense I, section of recovery swim. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> but that's now that I think about it, that is very much, I, I use that term jokingly, a, a roll-in vacation, but that's because that's the vacations that we went yeah, on as got kids. Brand yeah. name to the vacation. Yeah. 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 Because it was, we were, my dad was... You know, you rest when you die. Yeah, was his, yeah. It's his mantra. You, you, you sleep when you die. And right. so it's... We're gonna... He said that, but I bet he's still resting a bit now. He's still alive. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. He's yeah. retired and he's very he's much... Uh, um, Johnny, you mentioned uh, a workplace being like a family. We have a culture where people say it's like a family. Some workplaces, I think, would say we are a family. Yeah. Can a workplace be a family? Yeah, definitely. Can it and actually be I a mean, family? But I mean, in both countries, in both countries, SMEs mom and pop shops, small business, owner led businesses, get, go all across Europe, Germany, Switzerland, maybe not so much for us, but go all those countries. What we think of as a company is the big ones. But if you look at who employs the most people, it's the small ones. So like, let's walk down the shop out the street outside our office. There'll be 20, 30, 40 businesses. And all of those are probably run by a family, a person, the, the corner shop where I get my hardware. There's the mum, the dad. Mm. And when I went in there, they said, oh, our son's looking for work as a graphic designer. You, like, it's a family. So we our, think- our printers as well, Call Quick. Call Father Quick, son. Warren, brilliant, yeah. love it. If you go over to Westfield and start wandering around these big shops, Hugo Boss or, uh, you know, all the other stores that are there, there probably were family businesses that got big. I'm thinking actually the entertainer, the toy shops over there as well, actually got to meet the CEO of the entertainer family guy, family business. They don't open on Sunday, not for religious reasons, but because he said, we want to have a family day. We want, you know, we want to have one day where our employees are available at home, if pos. Uh, if we open every day, it's the case that there's no day for those families to get together and have that meal because someone's always out. So they, you know, so I think, I think businesses are normally started by a founder and or their family. And especially in that stage, it grows. Most businesses are probably run by families, but the big ones probably not. So there are some businesses that are quite literally families or family companies. What about organizations that aren't blood related in any way? Can those be families? What do you think, Cody? See, this is where John, I may disagree with you a little bit. We're supposed to disagree. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm very careful to position interactive workshops with my team that we are not a big F family that I'm not the dad. Again, as much as my leadership style may lend towards that, I try to be very careful. I'm not the dad. You're not my sister. You're not my brother. Um, we are, at the end of the day, we are a business. And I do that for them, not for, for me. I want them to have that mental separation that they don't feel that they're so beholden to the, the company, the work, that they can't have their own boundaries in life. Like there's an expected loyalty or going above and beyond that's part of the standard. Maybe. I would, I want them to go above and beyond. And I think we hire people that do mm. naturally want to go above and beyond, but I want that to come from their own uh, internal motivators, not from some sense of guilt driven loyalty yeah, yeah. to the, to the, the company. That is interesting about the, the, whether the loyalty is guilt driven slash, um, felt demanded of versus real. And I do feel that that's where those two dynamics, like whether it's top down, like, you're part of this family or this company, you're part of this company, you should be loyal versus you work for this company, you you want to be here. That's where those there's those power dynamics playing out, right? 
Do you feel like you have to be here, Chris? I mean, I don't feel like I have to be here. No. The podcast? <laughs> no, but I do think there's um, there's some relationships in work that can be like the parental or the brother sister relationships that can carry you through. We know the strength of relationships in terms of employee retention and, and feeling satisfied with your job role. And I think some of those relationships are important. Whether you say you're a family or not is perhaps a different question. But it, it can be very like a family and that can be really helpful. Well, and to, to build on that and to not necessarily counter my own point, but my best friends in life right now are folks that I have worked with in the past. And I count the two of you in that same category. Oh, that's awkward. That you worked with us in the past. Yeah. Yeah. And the present. <laughs> and, the, and the present. And the present. Good, oh, good, good, good. That's I thought we were going to get fired. Then. Yeah. I, thought that, I thought that was it. <laughs> Cody's resignation. On yeah, I, thought gonna, I thought we were out. Oh, right. He was in. <laughs> I'm here to... It's the Cody this, show from yeah, this, now on. Yeah, yeah. This, <clears> we'll leave. The, Gentlemen, I wanted you to be here when I told you I was taking over the podcast. <laughs> We're still friends. The Rolling Show. Yeah, 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 this yeah. Is exactly. But all of my my best friends in life right now are those that are former or current work colleagues. Thank you, Cody. And so whether or not I considered them, I guess in, I've never considered them big F family, but they are the closest relationships outside of my core nucleus family that that I have. And so I think... So that, that the question, yes, absolutely, work can be a wonderful source of meaning, of connection, of belonging for for many, and it. But it does take intentional efforts on the part of the team and the the leader to make that that happen. Definitely, mm -hmm. and I think I think there's also great value from overlapping family life and work life. Again, it's kind of it's a very westernized model that your family and your work are separate. It's, they call it a, a monochronic culture when you've got that. But if you've got polychronic culture, which is often more common in Asia, there's a big overlap between work and family life. Uh, I've worked in India. The, the polychronic culture is one of the best examples there. You have your family and your work joined up. Obviously, the West has somehow exported monochronic corporate culture to different countries around the world. But um, the, the, the need to keep those truly separate, I mean, I, you brought your kids into work I bring yeah. my kids to work yeah. when we had our big um, dinner when we launched US we took Cody's family out for dinner with my daughter I do think that that is a really important overlay mm -hmm. to understand if I can I really know Chris if I don't really know his wife if I don't really know his daughter I, lo I love that synergy I, lo I love visiting Cody when we went out to New Jersey yeah meeting all the kids but playing it, with Lego it spills through into the work we do as well yeah. you know we were designing a big leadership program for a big UK PLC global company and um, we, we got into the nitty gritty of the research we spent time anthropologically exploring what people really wanted from a leadership program. And one of the things they said was, I've worked with some of these people for 20 years and I've never met their other half. I want to meet their other half. I want to meet their children. I, I want to see them in some clothes that aren't those work clothes that I've looked at for 10 years that they keep wearing. This is a bit of a mask in a way, isn't yeah, it? Well, who's so, the real person? But I think, so I think that, longing's, that longing's there. Mm. There's also a part like, okay, so if we can't share that with our work colleagues... Are we being are we de being defensive then? Is there there's a boundary that that's, that's my private life? Well, we're social beings. Is other bits of your life really private? I bet you go home and talk about things that happen at work and mm. say oh, this person who tells stories to your mm. other half or yeah. maybe to your parents or whatever else. But so you you take that bit of your life and mm. your storytelling there. Yeah. Like, can you not insert your family yeah. and for, the, that yeah. into your working life? For, for some people, I think they're. They need that separation, that private life. Some things are just mm. private life. Some job roles, confidential information. Yeah, you can't spy, take them into the workplace. It might be unsafe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So a forklift um, driver with the baby on the lap, maybe yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. But in other, in other ways, in other workplaces, you can absolutely have the, the possibility of doing it. <clears throat> um, if you feel tearful, you okay? <clears throat> yeah, no, I'm fine. Just get on my phone. <laughs> it's very emotional. <laughs> this, is a, this is an emotional topic. I've, so. I found it really helpful bringing, yeah, my daughter into the office. My wife has come on our, our team uh, off-sites when we've invited other halves. It's it's really helpful to have that synergy. And I don't personally actually find it more mentally draining to try and separate them. Mm. And if you have this kind of, I don't look at work emails when I'm at home, if, if my, what if my wife calls me while I'm at work? I'm probably going to pick that up. So the other way around, yeah. I take a bit of time out of working. That's that's what I call home that life. polychronic culture. You're you're happy to have those things. I'm happy mixed to up. juggle. And sometimes I well, say, so, you know, why why are you on your emails? It's like I I want to take care of this off off my own back. It's not that like I'm forced to or someone's mm. making me work late. It's just to get everything done, to be happy, to 
go to bed satisfied. Just, I need to take care of this. Well, and that's, that. that's so interesting because I was actually reflecting on this this morning, walking over here for the first five years of my career, I did not bring my laptop home. Mm. I had a very strict work is work, home is home, personal policy. And it worked well for us because I was able to make that, that separation. Uh, with the, obviously the pandemic over the past couple of years and now of working in a much more hybrid uh, work environment, those, those barriers are now completely gone. And it's very common for, uh, I try to very, I try to respect what's going on with our, our clients and not have my kids jump in on calls. But on, on team calls, it's not uncommon for one of my sons to jump into the call and we're, they're right there with us. And I love it when I see my, uh, our clients when their kids or their, the dog or the cat is walking around mm -hmm. in the background. But I also do recognize that that can be a cause of stress for everybody. Yeah. That as those barriers have come down, that they're, it, it's harder now to feel that, that you can turn off at night. So that, that it was a perfect example. You may be sitting there at 8 o'clock at night uh, knocking out an email because you want to, but yet your significant other views that as a, oh, well, you're prioritizing work yeah. over yeah. over family yeah. time. It's and funny, so I'm, I'm having a bit of an epiphany about where some of my working models come from, but my grandfather's a farmer. So you live on your farm. He had a farm that he rented. He lived on the farm. Uh, everything that needed to be done in season had to be done. It's, I, can you imagine the farmer, the alarm goes off because there's potentially an intruder in the barn and they go, oh yeah, because it's, it's six o'clock, so I'm not yeah. going. Uh, well, you've forgotten to feed some of the animals and you're like... Equally, can you imagine a really clock. sunny day in summer when the hay's all cut and uh, the farmer just say, let's just get up some beers and sit and enjoy the sunset. Yeah. But it's interesting, again, if we think about the post-industrial revolution corporatized view of what work is versus the pre-industrial revolution agricultural familial setup, there is sort of this constant individualization separation that's embedded into the corporate culture. I, I personally don't think it's good for us. I I think that um, we're a holistic human being, but we do it in other areas. Like we we go and do exercise at work together at lunchtime. We might go for a run or a cycle. We go do cycling, don't we? Yeah. So it's why is it that that has to be fully separated out? All the expectations it should be, and I guess I see that what happened through the move to hybrid working is a return back to a more pre-industrial revolution working model. I'm at home and my community's around me and I'm getting my little farming job done with my laptop. And then at lunchtime, I might pop out and go to a cafe and I might pick up my kids from school and I might do a bit more. And, you know, if I need to knock off a bit early, in fact, in the UK, the rise of appointments in beauticians at four o'clock on a, or three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon is currently through the roof. Like the people are using the flexibility to get the things they need done done and get their work done. So, yeah. Well, and I think that's the source of a lot of the frustration with the, the return to office mandates. It's not about being or not being in the office. It's the flexibility. It's being able to manage your, yeah. your life yeah. in, in ways that you see fit and that works best for you. And what works best for you may not fit a corporate mold. Yeah. But, but also there's a question there, isn't it? So if you're working in a company, but you're trying to do what's best for you, I think that's where the conflict is. If you work for a company and you, are you not also trying to do what's best for them? And I think that's where the conflict comes in the return to work mandate. If people, if your people in the company believe that it's best for the company that everyone returns to work, it probably may not be best for the individuals, but it's a question of where your true loyalty lies. And I think that's why it's so painful is because some people's true loyalty lies to what's best for them, even though they're involved in a collective effort with their workmates. And that's why I think these conflicts arise. I mean, the idea that our client, if we, if you think about our clients who are, Essentially, it's a similar transaction. They're paying us to do things. And if they were to say to us, we want this to run, this workshop to run in central London, and we said to them, oh, well, I'm, I'm at home that day. So by all means, have the people there, but I'll just turn up my video. They'd be like, no, <laughs> no, it's not going to work. <laughs> or if they said, we want to run this event in Hong Kong, and we said, well, it's nice that you'd like it in Hong Kong, but fly yeah. those people from Hong Kong to London. Yeah. Because that's where that's we where are. They just is. wouldn't pay us anymore. No, no. So I think, I think there is something in the psychological transaction. People have moved from mm. a model of what's best for mm. us or what's best for the collective or even what my leaders want us to do versus what is best for me. Mm. And then when you dig in on that, you're anti-collaborative. The companies obviously don't always handle it well, but that's mm. the, that's the, um, the, the dilemma that's causing that anger, I think. Mm. Well, and I think another layer of that is there's a misunderstanding of what is best for an individual. 
they may think it's best for to be home and uh, on Zoom all day and be, have that flexibility, but is that truly best for them from a relationship standpoint, yeah. from a career standpoint? So it's I, I, I agree. I think it is a, a question of loyalties, but also maybe a misunderstanding of what, what yeah. truly is, is best for and, them. And coming back to family, if, if you just have that relationship with your families where you just say phone calls are enough, right. FaceTime's enough, yeah. sometimes you live a long way from your family and it has to be enough. But if you just never showed up to family dinners or anything, yeah. So Thanksgiving dinner, feel? yeah. Thanksgiving dinner could be the metaphor, but you know, are you there because you feel you have to be there and it's what's best for everybody, but you don't really want to be there, or do you go to Thanksgiving mm. dinner because that's really where you want to be? They're very different motivations, aren't they? Mm. We were talking about the competing nature of family life, you know, the home life and, and the work life, regardless of where you work. Is it true, do you think, Cody, that no success in work can compensate for failure in the home? Again, I know I'm. this is going to be a sensitive topic for, for many, but yes, I do believe that that statement is true. I do believe that at the end of the day, the family is the fundamental unit of society. And again, how you define family, we'll, we'll leave that up to you individually, but that family is the fundamental unit of society. And many of the breakdowns that we see in society today are a result of the breakdown of families. And so much of the, I mean, we've talked about it, the, the skills, the, the, the culture, the, the values that we all have sitting around this table, we developed around the kitchen table growing up. Whether that was during robust, uh, intense discussions or whether it was through very calm and, and orderly discussions or, or dinners, d there were values that were instilled and, and that when families break down, it, it impacts society as a whole. So if someone is wildly successful in professional life, I'll just leave it, if, if whatever their profession is, and uh, causes their family to suffer, I think there is a, a, an opportunity for that person to step back and say, where are where are my priorities? Where are my priorities and where should they be? Yeah. Me? Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd see it more as like a concept of alignment versus trade-offs. So in anything, if you're using trade-offs to mitigate situations, it's less than optimal. Can you get alignment? Can you align? Like I don't like the idea of work-life balance. I'd rather look at the holistic picture and say, is, about it, is this working? Yeah. So, so if you're home life is competing against your work life and your work life competes against your home life and your, your inner narrative or your external dialogues are trade-offs one against the other and, you know, my other half's annoyed that I'm working late or on an email, my boss wants me in. You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you're in those dialogues, oh, I've got too much to do, I can't get it done. If you're in all of that, then that's trade-offs. Uh, I've done it once, I did it a couple of years ago. I don't work Fridays because it's part of my strategy to get these things working. I obviously do do work on Fridays, but I tell everyone I'm not working Fridays. Uh, but one client, we, we had a project. I needed to work every Friday and work, work intensely. And my exercise life disintegrated just because that one day where I normally go and do that fell off a cliff. But I think for me, it's about getting those alignments. And you've got, if, if you can get that, it works really well. If you're, if you're outside, if you're outside of that and you're, you're trading off against each other, there's just building resentment and it's draining and it's worth having a, good conversation with yourself about how to, or, or a good friend about how mm. to get that aligned. Mm. I agree. And I think that's a very wise approach to take. How can you, because I completely agree, work-life balance is a, is a complete misnomer. How can you align your life such that those two are in harmony with each other? Mm. And there may be changes that need, are needed to be made. That's fine. But I love that approach of not, it's not a zero sum game. That yeah. if one wins, the other loses. Yeah, exactly. That, that you can make both successful. And in all of the uncontrollables of life, those two things are quite controllable, where you work and, and what you make of your home life. Home life. Yeah. yeah. I've got one final, and we, we were butting up against time, but I thought you might want to enjoy a certain family dinner. So this is the kind of thing you we... You prepared a dinner for us? Yeah. Oh, lovely. Well, I prepared a dinner dialogue. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking about the word flocky knocky pillar vilification. Mm. And I'm, um, Should we debate its meaning? Yeah, what do you mm. think it, what do you guys Let's think start, it means? Can you spell it? <laughs> yeah. Flocky, 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 flocky pillar filification. This is actually one of the actual words that we ran the dinner table. Wow. Um, yeah, so. I'm going to learn something new today. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I mean, mean, there's so many bits of that word going on there. Yeah. I don't know where to start. But I'm, just a, this, I'm just surprised you don't know what it means, guys. I mean, you're two intelligent people. <laughs> do you not read? Do you not, um, do you not sort of... Uh, <laughs> Work on spelling spelling bees in America. Surely this say, I'm going to ch- chalk this up to my American. <laughs> yeah. This, 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 yeah, yeah, it's supposed to be a British English yeah, term. No, I, don't look at no, me. It's the the action or habit of estimating something as worthless. So the wow. habitual estimating things as work, worthless. And I'd say so. Family life, the reverse of flocky knocky for living location. <laughs> family, family, very worthwhile, whether at home or at work. <laughs> coming to the end i feel like we could go for half an hour longer we shouldn't we should wrap up the podcast before we do um cody tell us a little bit more about what's going on in iw new york we have a growing team and a growing base of some amazing clients we work with some amazing leaders some amazing teams it is an honor to come in to work every day it is humbling to think about some of the projects that we're working on some of the teams that we're working with from sales enablement to leadership development, executive coaching, team effectiveness. We do some change management for some, some of our clients. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an incredible time at IWNY, and it is energizing. And it's coming back to the, the mothership, coming back to London here is just equally energizing. It's, it's nice to remember we are part of a bigger team because while we are growing in the, in the U.S., we're still a, located in the U.S. We're still a small team. And so it's wonderful to come back here and reignite some of those small F family relationships. And really exciting, yeah. Small team doing a big job. And also yeah. in some really interesting sectors. So you've got a massive amount of work in technology with, with Cisco and other things. We've got uh, very high finance in uh, asset management and hedge funds. And Yep. We've got the music industry. We have a lot in the construction industry. We've got oil and gas. That's that's one of the amazing things about IW is we, we take the best of different industries and share those across different industries. We don't try to specialize in just a single industry and say, we're going to be the experts in this. We're going to bring the best from all across the spectrum of business and, and help our clients see different ways of, of approaching their problems and their, what's working in one industry actually may provide some insights for another mm. industry. Yeah, it's, and part, it's part of the secret source, isn't it? We're not specialized. And I know that no. I always think we probably should be specialized in certain industries, but clients just repeatedly tell us part of the joy is that you're bringing all the ideas from other verticals, other sectors, and, and, and the mm. breadth and uh, height of experience. Yeah, and very exciting. Excited to see the next stage of IWNY. <laughs> and as, as that grows, uh, the exciting things that are to come from you, Cody. So thank you very much for joining us for the podcast. Uh, I think we'll get Cody back for another episode. What do you think, John? Oh, yeah, let's do it. Come on. Let's do that. We'll love it. If you'll have yeah. me, I'll okay. be back. Fantastic. Excellent. If you have liked this episode, uh, please do leave a review on the podcast. Do all the things around the podcast. Uh, like it, reply, leave, a, leave an answer to a question whatever's there share it with a family member share it with a family member wouldn't that be a lovely thing to do yeah yeah i Let know you care one of our interns i know they are w- watching our podcast with their mum in the car they're talking about oh, oh that's, that's, that's that's nice i hope they're it? listening to moment. it actually i've just realized i hope they're not watching it with their mum in the car because no no you shouldn't be doing that well Don't he can be that. watching it while she drives right <laughs> maybe yeah, yeah or maybe. he could drive while she watches yeah exactly <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah so wherever this is uh reaching you maybe in the car uh thank you for listening it is also worth mentioning We are running events virtually and in person, and those are available to sign up to. So you can go to interactiveworkshops.com forward slash events, and you can sign up to our latest events. You might like to meet us in person, not just in the car through your ears. People have been quite impressed since they've met us after we started the podcast. They feel like they know us already. Yeah, bit of relationship. Yeah. There we go. Thank you, gents. We're stars. See you soon. Thanks for watching this video by Interactive Workshops. Give it a like down below and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next video. Click through to here or here to watch another video by Interactive Workshops.